Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another week of, of live streaming for Verishop. Um, we're talking today about sunscreens, um, and we're going to go over all kinds of ways to choose the sunscreen that is right for you. Um, and so I'll give it a few minutes um, and select where we want to begin. So let's start with a really good sunscreen that I love um, called Super Goop Matte Screen. Um, this one looks like it's sold out. So we'll be presenting a lot of different, um, a lot of different sunscreens. So don't worry about that. Um, but I'm just going to use this one as an example to talk about labeling on sunscreens and what it all means. So um, the first thing that you see when you look at a sunscreen label is the SPF. So the SPF stands for sun protection factor. And the SPF is measured by uh, in a lab where a subject will be illuminated with ultraviolet B rays. And the, there will be a measurement uh, based on when the person's skin turns red. Um, and what SPF means is that uh, the SPF is the amount of times more than normal someone could stay in the sun without getting red. So an SPF of 10 means that you can stay in the sun 10 times as long as you could without that and get the same amount of redness. That means that SPF is not linear. So an SPF of 20 is not double an SPF of 10. An SPF of 10 is already pretty good. It's allowing you to stay in the sun 10 times as long as you normally would be able to. 20 is even better. 30 is even better than that. And so when we look at the way SPF relates to how much radiation from UV is blocked, it's actually exponential. Actually, no, it's the opposite of exponential, asymptotic. So at 10, you're at SPF of 10, it seems really low, but you're actually blocking 90% of the rays of UVB that get through the atmosphere to your skin. When you get to SPF of 15, you get to 92%. SPF of 20 is 95%. SPF of 40 is 97.5%. So that's why dermatologists usually say an SPF of 30 or higher. Some people will say 50, the difference between 30 and 50 is just a few percentage points, um, probably like, you know, maybe two percentage points. Um, so it's really a minimal amount of change. What I tell people is that the most important thing is whether you like to wear it, because that's going to decide whether you do wear it and whether you can reapply. So you want to find something, even if it's an SPF of 20, that you like to put on. Because if you like to put it on, then you can put on enough and reapply it frequently enough that you're gonna get really good protection from that. If you insist on using an SPF, or if I insist on a patient uses an SPF of 100 and it's a tacky, white, uh, you know, unpleasant experience to put it on, then they are not gonna use it. So Matt's, I find super good products really, really um, nice to apply. And um, this one is SPF of 40. So this is blocking 97.5% of UVB rays. Now UV is broken down into two different categories. Um, one is uh, UVA, which dermatologists like to remember by saying UVA is like aging. So A for aging. So UVA is the ultraviolet light that is ca that causes more photo aging. UVB, B for burning. UVB is the ultraviolet light that causes more burning and more skin cancer. So SPF only measures UVB. That's because UVB is what turns us pink when we're in the sun. UVA doesn't. So you can get a lot of UVA and on, in, in 
the subsurface of the skin. It's aging you and it's causing damage, but it's not going to turn your skin red and it's not going to burn you. So when they measure the how red you get when you apply a product, which is the way they measure SPF, they're only looking at UVB. So when we see a product that says SPF of 40, we know that you can stay out 40 times as long as you would normally have been able to stay out without getting as red. 40, an SPF of 40 blocks 97.5% of rays. An SPF of, nine, of 20 blocks still 95% of rays. So once you can get to 30 or higher, you're good. You just want to find something that you like to apply. And I personally love this matte screen. I think it's really pleasant to apply. Um, it has a good SPF. Now let's look at the other, you know, things on the label. So this is 100% mineral. Mineral is, um, means that the sunscreen uses zinc or titanium to block ultraviolet rays. If you're using a chemical blocker, that's going to use other molecules to absorb ultraviolet light. And those are, are hugely varied. Some of them are potentially damaging to coral reefs, and most of them are not. Um, some of them turn into benzene, which you may have read about when it's left um, on the shelf for too long and it expires, and most of them don't. So you can't really villainize all chemical sunscreens. You just have to make sure that you're using a reputable brand that's dermatologist recommended and using chemical blockers that are safe. There's a chemical blocker called Cinemate. Cinemate is cinnamic acid. That's derived from cinnamon. So it's, it doesn't mean that they're um, chemicals. They could be sort of natural in the sense that it's derived from cinnamon, but it just means that it's the way that it absorbs ultraviolet light. It doesn't reflect it, it absorbs it. And so that's what makes it a chemical blocker. Mineral blockers do absorb chem, uh, ultraviolet as well, but they also scatter light, almost like a reflective surface. In the past, getting a mineral blocker like matte screen meant that you were like those lifeguards from the 70s where you'd have like a white cast all over your nose because it used to be that zinc and titanium was very difficult to micronize and make cosmetically elegant. But now zinc and titanium can be used in formulations in a very cosmetically elegant way that goes on really smooth, that feels really good, that blends in well. Uh, many sunscreens don't. Many sunscreens that use mineral blockers like Neutrogena ba for babies, you know, it's, it's good because it's all mineral, but it's tacky and white and it doesn't look good. So you want to find someone that get something again that you like to wear. Matte screen I think is really pleasant to wear and it's 100% mineral. So if you're looking for mineral, this is the way to go. Let me just go now to Supergoop Unseen, which is sort of the counterpoint to this one, which is also a beautiful sunscreen that feels really, really good, but it's chemical. And so when a sunscreen is a chemical blocker, it used to be that um, mineral blockers were more cosmetically inelegant and chemical blockers were more cosmetically elegant in the sense that they could be applied and go on clear and have less odor and less of a cast behind. And this one really lives up to that. I love Unseen Sunscreen because it feels so good to put on. It's very silicone-y and smooth and matte. It doesn't feel oily. It doesn't feel sticky or tacky. It doesn't have a smell. It doesn't have a color. It's perfectly clear. Um, and the way that they can do this is by using chemical blockers. Um, and these chemical blockers that they use are safe, and um, and they're they're great. Um, so see, it's it's completely clear. Um, and so if I apply it on, even if I don't rub it in, you can't see anything, which is amazing. And I think it's really great for all skin types. And I think it feels good to put on. I think it's a great great sunscreen. So that is my spiel on chemical blockers. So I think, you know, chemical blockers, you don't have to be afraid of. Find a brand that you trust. I trust Supergoop. Um, and, you know, um, and just be confident. You know, there was this whole thing about um, sunscreens that were left on the shelf and they detected really tiny amounts of benzene, which is a carcinogen. The amounts of benzene that they detected were tiny. 
None of the super group products had it. It was in a bunch of aerosol uh, products from other companies. Um, and uh, they detected these tiny, tiny amounts of benzene. The thing is, benzene, you know, it, it's a, the, the dose determines the poison. Benzene in those tiny, tiny doses we're exposed to whether we're using these sunscreens or not. Um, we know that sun is a carcinogen. Sun causes cancer. So you want to find a sunscreen that you love putting on. Even if that's a chemical blocker, you want to, if, if you use that correctly, then you are blocking a known carcinogen from damaging your cells and giving you skin cancer. So totally into Supergroup Unseen Sunscreen. Let's keep going on the label. Um, so let's look at the next, um, let's, you know, at, you know, present something new, which is I also love, which is also mineral. Um, and it's um, kind of specifically for the eye area. Again, I think it's really smooth. I think it's pleasant to put on. Um, and the next thing on the label on all of these is broad spectrum. So what does broad spectrum mean? So we talked about the different ultraviolet rays. We have UVA and UVB. UVB causes burning. So SPF is only measuring UVB. This one has an SPF of 40. So it's, it's saying that you can go in the sun 40 times as long while wearing this as you could without it and still not get red. Um, 40 of SPF blocks 97.5% of rays. So that's perfectly acceptable. Um, then broad spectrum. So broad spectrum is a term to look for when you're buying sunscreen. Broad spectrum means that it was tested for UVA blockage. UVA is what causes aging. A is for aging. So, you know, as a dermatologist, I don't want, I mean, I want to protect people from skin cancer and burning, but I also do a lot of anti-aging and I want to protect people from photo aging. And so I want to protect people from UVA. Um, UVA is much more ubiquitous than UVB. UVA gets through glass, whereas UVB doesn't. So UVA comes through your windows in your house and it comes through the windows of your car. So you want to find, so if you just find a sunscreen that says an SPF of 100 and it doesn't say broad spectrum, then you're not necessarily getting UVA blockage and you're getting all of that radiation coming in through your car window as you're driving or coming in through your window at your house. So you want to find broad spectrum. This is not a term that beauty companies can throw around. Um, it's not like things that are unregulated, like clean beauty and things like that, that have no real meaning. This is uh, something that's really specific. It requires uh, trials to be done and submitted to the FDA. And the FDA will tell a sunscreen whether they are allowed to use the term broad spectrum. So it really means something. So when you look at that SPF, that's a term regulated by the FDA. If you look at, if it says broad spectrum, it means that the FDA has determined based on studies that this blocks a significant amount of UVA. Now, UVA is particularly important to block for aging. UVA is also close to visible light. So the way that our, our, our light spectrum works, right, is you have infrared which is like heat then it shifts to red so some animals can see in infrared humans can't but as soon as it hits red we can see those rays then it's going to shift from red to orange to yellow to green to blue after blue it starts to turn violet right and then we get to ultraviolet so blue light is right on the border of ultraviolet so when we're blocking ultraviolet, we're mostly blocking B because that's the SPF. Then we're looking for broad spectrum to block A. Now, there are some conditions and some people who have certain hyperpigmentation like melasma or the mask of pregnancy, which is more of a hormonal darkening of your skin, which is super common. In those conditions, you want to block even more than UVA. You want to block some blue light. You want to get into the visible light spectrum. The way we know that a sunscreen is blocking some visible light is 
if it has a little tint to it. And if it has a tint, then it probably has iron oxide in it. And iron oxide is going to be listed in the inactive ingredients. Um, and it's listed in the inactive ingredients because the FDA is not considering iron oxide a drug. But as a dermatologist, I'm telling you that iron oxide is um, effective. And I'm going to present this one again because I know that it has iron oxide in it. And I know it's sold out and I'm sorry. Um, but this one has iron oxide in it. Most tinted, suns most tinted mineral sunscreens do. You can look for it in the inactive ingredients and that is a way to make sure that you're covering some blue light. The sun emits a lot of blue light. That's just visible light that we're bathing in at all times. And that can cause hyperpigmentation too. So you wanna use something that has a little bit of a tint to it. Let's talk about um, the body and let's use that as a way to talk about water resistant. So glow oil is water resistant up to 80 minutes. That means that the FDA has determined that 80 minutes of, uh, you know, water exposure doesn't inactivate the sunscreen. It doesn't wash the sunscreen off. This is also something that the FDA regulates. So it's not just making a claim. It's not just the company telling you that it's water resistant. It really is. It, it's an FDA claim um, that they need certain studies to have, have it on the label. Water resistance can either be listed as water resistant for 40 minutes or water resistant for 80 minutes. 80 minutes is the longest. So if you want to get something that is good for activity, um, good for a beach day, then this is a great one to get because it's water resistant up to 80 minutes. It's not allowed for them to say waterproof anymore. You can't say waterproof. You can't say sweat proof. You can't say all day protection. You can't say sunblock. Everything in a sunscreen label is very, very specific. Let's look at, um, this is another one that I, that I really like. This is a mineral aerosol um, sunscreen blocker, um, which um, is, you know, really helpful. I think for kids, the spray is great. Um, I, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's easy to use. It's good for the body. This one is a mineral one. And then I also have a, a chemical one, which just has a little bit of a different feel. I think it's a little bit more cosmetically elegant. It goes on a little bit clearer. Um, and, um, you know, it just, it, it might smell a little bit better, a little less like sunscreen. And that's the benefit of getting um, chemical blockers. Um, and so, you know, I think out of all the body ones, my favorite one is the glow oil. Um, I think it just kind of, it makes your skin look nice. It feels nice. It's not aerosolized, which is better for the environment. It's just a spray bottle. Um, and the reason it can be co so cosmetically elegant is that it's a chemical blocker. Um, but I'm confident in all of these chemical blockers that they use, um, avobenzone, homosalate, octosalate, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, you should consider them safe and you should use these so that you prevent skin cancer from a known carcinogen, which is sunlight. Another place not to neglect with sunscreen is the lips. Um, I think um, you want to try to find an SPF lip balm. Um, that's because... Your, your lower lip gets a lot of sun exposure. Your, the sun is shining directly down. You're going to get a lot of sun right on your malar cheeks, on your nose, and on your lower lip. These are all areas where the sun hits. And so you don't, you know, you're going to be careful everywhere else. But if you neglect the lip, it's going to get kind of like permanently chapped. Um, it gets crusty. Um, it gets wrinkly. It gets skin cancer there. It gets precancers. You can even get sunspots there. So you can get a lot of sun damage on your, over, on, on your lower lip that doesn't look very attractive and is a little bit difficult to treat, you know, with lasers and things like that. So, um, you know, this is a great area to make sure that you're protecting. Um, so in this uh, 
live, I included, you know, some other things that I like that sort of like, I would call like adjuncts to sunscreen. Um, one adjunct to sunscreen is a vitamin C serum. Vitamin C is always um, a nice thing to put on um, before you put on your sunscreen. So this one I think is a really nice serum um, that has vitamin C in it. Um, and vitamin C is the skin's most important antioxidant. Antioxidants help to clean up uh, damage that is caused by environmental exposures, including ultraviolet. And so when you're putting a vitamin C or other antioxidants underneath your sunscreens, you're getting typically better coverage and better protection. So these are really good things to use in the morning under your sunscreens. Another one that I like is um, this one, vitamin C elixir, which is um, a little more watery, um, a little more oily and watery, um, which is um, just a different texture. I think they're both great. The core organics one is just a little tiny bit thicker, um, a little bit um, more substantial on the skin, a little bit stickier, um, which I, I don't really mind for this. Um, and this one is a little less sticky, um, you know, goes on like almost like water, very nicely absorbent um, and a really, really nice thing to put on pre uh, sunscreen. Let's, um, so, so the other thing that I included are kind of two versions of this Kaylee Cosmetics uh, self tanner. Um, when patients want to get tan, I completely understand that having a tan is attractive. Um, the problem is that any tan, even a base tan, no matter what the color is from and what it looks like and how slowly you get it, it's always a cost. So you're always going to be trading in your tan for sun damage down the road. So your tan is going to turn into sunspots and age spots and wrinkles um, and leathery skin and loose skin as you get older. And people who come in with a skin cancer or with brown spots, they say like, well, I'm really careful with sunscreen. And I'm like, well, this is not from last week. This is from years and years of cumulative sun exposure. So tanning is uh, not only dangerous for skin cancer, but it also um, is a trade-off. So if you want to be tan now, you have to understand that if you're going to get a natural tan with the sun, you're going to be paying for it later. You're going to be trading it in for sun damage and sunspots and wrinkles, et cetera, later. So when possible, I recommend that people use self-tanner or bronzers. I think self-tanners are great because they use um, something called dihydrate dihydroxyacetone, which is um, a chemical that reacts with the keratin and the stratum corneum, your dead skin cell layer. That takes two weeks to shed. So when it reacts to that and the whole thing turns like slightly tan, it takes about two weeks for it to fully fade. So it's it's not, you know, it's relatively long lasting. This one, I, li I like the ones that give you, you know, every time you use it, give you like a little bit more shade because then as you use them, it can look really, really natural. I think when you just get a spray tan, you know, it can look a little unnatural because it's spotty in some places. But when you use something that like, like um, that does it gradually over a few days, you can sort of build the tan in a very natural way. This one I think is, you know, it's super, you know, pleasant to use. It's very, very um, watery. It, when you spray it, it just comes out like a mousse like this, that, um, you rub it on, it dries really quickly. It has no color to it. It doesn't stain anything. Um, and then you leave it on for a few hours. When you shower later, you wash it off and you notice that um, the skin looks a little tanner, which is great. And it's a, a way to get a tan without having to damage your skin. That way you can, I recommend that when before going on vacation or before going to the beach, do some self tanner so you feel good about yourself and you feel nice and tan, and then you'll be fine slathering on the sunscreen. If you get to the beach and you feel pasty, 
you're gonna wanna resist putting on the sunscreen so you can get a little bit of a tan. Trust me, you don't wanna pay for the tan later. I see a lot of sun damage that we're treating with lasers and surgery, chemical peels, things like that, and it's better to prevent it in the first place. Um, I'll just prevent, present um, another option. I'm not sure what the difference is on this one. One of them I think is, I don't know, maybe this one's a little bit bigger or something. Um, but anyway, I think it's a great self tanner that I really like and that, that I'm planning to buy again probably um, because I think it looks really nice and natural. It looks like a natural tan and it's um, e really easy to use, which I think is important. So to recap, um, you know, I think, uh, let me go to, you know, one of my favorite things, which is this bright eyed SPF. You know, I think um, you want to look for the SPF. So 30 or higher is fine. Honestly, I'm okay with even 20, as long as you really like it, you're going to wear it every single day and you're going to put, you're going to apply enough of it and you're going to reapply it. These tests are done when, you know, if you looked at the people who are, you know, being uh, tested for, for these uh, studies for the SP, uh, F, FDA for SPF, they put on a lot of sunscreen in that, in that area that they're uh, irradiating. So, you know, are you getting enough? You might not be. You have to make sure you're really applying a heavy layer. So you have to wear something that you really, really like to wear. If you don't like to wear it, you're not going to apply enough. You're not going to apply it often enough. And you're not going to reapply it often enough. And it's not going to be worth it. Um, so that's SPF. To re, you know, as part of our recap, broad spectrum, you always want to look for broad spectrum. That means that it covers UVA. UVA is really important to cover because we're all, you know, if you're here, you're into beauty, you want to make sure that you're preserving your beauty and you're not letting UVA uh, reduce your collagen production and break down your collagen. So you want to use broad spectrum SPF, uh, sorry, broad spectrum sunscreens with SPF of 30 or higher. If you're going to be at the beach, find something that's water resistant for 40 or 80 minutes. That's also something that's regulated by the FDA. So if it says that, you can be confident that that is going to stay on your skin. Um, and then, um, you know, mineral versus chemical, it's really up to you and it's a preference. I think um, if you struggle with melasma, which is the mask of pregnancy, but you can get it with birth control pills and other things, super, super common in women. Um, if you struggle with that, you're going to want to look for mineral blockers that are tinted because mineral blockers are going to mostly cover UVA. And when they're tinted, they're going to cover a little bit of uh, blue light. If you're in doubt, you can look at the inactive ingredient list and look for iron oxide. Iron oxide means that it's going to cover some blue light. So if you want the best coverage you can possibly get, go for mineral, find something tinted and look for iron oxide. If you just need something to wear every day or something that you like using, I would go for the Super Goop Unseen Sunscreen. It's, you know, most people's all-time favorite. It's super, um, super cosmetically elegant. It's a pleasure to wear. It's odorless, colorless. Um, I use this every day. I recommend it to most of my patients when they don't need something a little stronger. Um, it's great for all skin types. It's, it's just a great, great product. And the reason that they can do this is because they're using chemical blockers here. They're perfectly safe, they're perfectly effective, but they're just a more cosmetically elegant way to formulate a sunscreen, which is why we're using them. So I think if you're in doubt about what sunscreen to use, or you're not sure you have one that you like yet, try this one. I think this one is incredible. So, I guess that is the end of my uh, live. I hope you all learned something. Um, you're welcome to message me on here or on Instagram um, at Dr. Dan Belkin. And um, I will see everybody next week if no one has any questions. Thank you so much for joining and uh, take care.